We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. about humans, and I, if you haven't thought about it, I'm sure you will, uh, we can and do eat anything. So what we can do is eat directly, so we can do, we can be completely become carnivorous, we could be almost completely herbivorous. If we can't eat it, like grass, we feed it to a cow who can eat it, or we do what Pascal does, which is takes the yeast and makes bread out of it. Uh, so we can also take that cow and cook it so we can actually get something out of it. I just picked this slide at random. This is not one that I think depicts much of anything. But the only reason I'm showing it is because I want you to get a, sort of an idea of the body size of what we're going to be talking about. None of these animals are small. Okay, so what did they eat? Well, how do you know? So one of the ways is to do morphological comparisons. So what you have here is the skull of a very robust ocelopithecine on your right, and you've got a very early archaic hominin on your left. You just can see that there's a massive difference. This is a chewing muscle that goes through here. It has a ridge on the top of its head where there's musculature that goes all the way up. It is a chewing machine. These are the teeth. So you see the size of these teeth versus the size of another fossil, Australopithecus africanus, compared to a modern human. So you can see the different sizes of teeth. There are people in this room who do that. I don't, but I can do it in general. Okay, what did they eat? You can also look at force and strain. You can look at, use a model. So what you've got here is a macaque monkey. This is done on a macaque monkey skull. This is not done on a live macaque, I don't believe, although those were um, implanted in macaques. Um, this is an australopithecine, a, or a cast thereof, shaped exactly like you would a, mo a, a, a live one, if you could. And you can see where the stress and the strain is coming. So what you've got is a lot of stress across here, which is where the chewing musculature is gonna go back behind here. And so you can see that this, the distribution of stress in some places is the same, and in other places it's not, because of what we're looking at is strain, deformation of the bone following stress. Another way of looking at it is microware. That's what these pictures are. This is work that was done by Mark Tiford and Peter Unger. And what they say is gorilla fineware stry, baboon-like pits, microflakes, and it shifts to hominin puncture crushing. What that tells you a little bit about what kinds of textures these animals were eating, but it doesn't tell you what they ate. Well, I like to go to general principles first. So although I'm not gonna give you models, I'll give you some general principles. One of those is as body size increases, metabolic rate decreases. Per kilo, that's not overall energetics. So for small animals, they have to eat small packages of high quality food that can be processed quickly. So you think of that Galago monkey. Galago pro prosimian. You look at a large animal, lots of low quality food, processed more slowly, and they tend to be more sedentary. And again, it's not total output of energy or total input of energy, it is per kilo. 
Well, okay, so from that, let's look at what primate foods are all about. Primate foods break down into sort of three categories, insects, leaves, and fruit. So what you're looking at are things that are insects. They move around a lot, but they're high in protein. These are also high in protein, but very difficult to digest. And they also are seasonal, so they will disappear, and so they actually move, but over time. Fruit is high in energy. I almost showed you orangutan fruits that do not look like they're high in energy, but most fruits are high in energy and they're easy to digest. They are, however, like leaves, mobile in time, they come seasonally. When you look at the primates that feed here, you have small primates, very small primates, that can feed on insects. Again, requires small packages of food, but highly easy to digest. You have large primates depicted by this gorilla. It's, again, high in protein, but very hard to digest. And gorillas don't move around as much as the microcebus does. I show you fruit, although there's no animal that can survive just on fruit because you don't get the protein content. But I show you some monkeys that are going to be feeding on fruit. You look at what these animals do do is you get people animals along the lines of frugivore folivores. So the large animals will be leaves, and then they combine that with fruit. Small animals will, buy, will either be totally insectivorous, or they'll combine that with fruit. What you never have is a primate that relies on leaves and insects. And that's just because a large animal cannot capture enough insects in order to be able to survive itself, or able to survive. So we look at this. In our body size, we should have been a food, food of our folivore, right? Okay, well, you know what your diet is. And I would say that this has been going on for a long time. We were not folivores, not for a very long time. So what do we do now about what did they eat? All right, this is the part that I will be presenting today and the data that I will present. And this, these are, have to do with stable isotopes. Stable isotopes are different forms of the exact same element. And the one I'm going to be talking about is carbon, because it's going to be in a mineral portion of enamel or in bone. And you don't get any kinds of organics in that. So what these elements, how they differ are different masses, which means that they react at different rates. And that means that if you've got some, something that reacts at different rates, that it can be distributed differently at, say, certain trophic levels across different parts of the same trophic level. And that's what we're going to be doing. We present that as C13, C12. Those are the two stable isotopes. You probably heard of carbon-14, which is radiocarbon. This is not a, a radioactive element. And so isotope. Then you get them presented as delta C13, and it's in per mil, just to make it read. You take a standard, you take your, your sample, you com compare them, and the difference is the delta. OK, how did this all get started? Well, we know that atmospheric CO2 is taken up by plants, by photosynthetic pathway. In 1948, we knew that there were plants that actually the way in which they took up CO2. And I have to say that there is a man, was at UCSD even when I got here, who was one of the men who discovered this. C4 plants, I'm not even gonna talk about them because that wasn't done at UCSD. <laughs> but they were, didn't, weren't even identified <laughs> until 1967. So we've had almost 20 years where people thought everything was like this. Now, what do we do now is look at the geochemistry. Well, Samuel Epstein, who uh, was at uh, Caltech, uh, in 1971 finally had his aha moment when he realized that all those plants that he had been collecting across country and everywhere else, and he could make no sense of it because they came out with a bimodal distribution, lo and behold, these were two different photosynthetic pathways. Those two photosynthetic pathways are actually different kinds of plants. So what you get here are what we call C4 plants. They're going to be arid season grasses, some sedges, not very many of them. And many of the succulents have the same numbers, even though they're not C4. They come out to be about a minus 12 uh, compared to atmospheric CO2, which is minus 7. And it's different than it was in the past, so we have to correct for that. Um, C3 plants actually take up their material differently. They fix in a, in a three carbon sugar at first. They come out to be minus 26. There is no overlap between C3 and C4. 
These are primate foods. These are leaves, fruits, seeds, herbaceous plants, all those kinds of things. Those are primate foods. These are not primate foods. All right, so, but we're not interested in the plants, right? We're interested in the animals. We're gonna to try to figure out what the animals do. The first lab study was by one of Sam Epstein's postdocs, Michael De Niro, that was actually my postdoc advisor. And so at Caltech, what they did is they took grasses and they took plants that had a C3 pathway and they fed it to lab rats. And what they discovered was that these two actually mimicked the plants that they ate. So they actually could see the difference. The one issue was, well, okay, but we don't know what the plants are when we're looking at these things from the Pliocene, the Miocene, and even the Pleistocene. Well, okay, you're gonna get a number, but what does that tell you about what the plant is or what's going on? You know, at this end, that's C4. You know, at this end, it's C3. What do you know about this? How is it offset from the diet? And what we found in this study is that the offset is about 10 per mil. These are animals with simple guts, just like you and I have. So there was another lab study that was done on Yama, of all things, and it was done, I believe, at the University of Utah. And what they did is they looked at the offset between these large animals and their diets. And lo and behold, they are quite different from one another. So that means if you're gonna use what you thought was the offset, which is minus 10, you're gonna have problems with an animal like a, a yama, a big animal, because it's not gonna give you the same kind of information about the diet. This is the reason why. Um, this is for one of the people in the audience. Um, what we have are cows, which are ungulates, and they also are ruminants. They have a very basic stomach in the forefront of their other parts of their digestive system. And what they do is they house huge, vast quantities of microorganisms. And what they can do then is they can actually ferment un indigestible material. They are, cows are non-selective feeders. If you look at the skull of a cow, it does not have any top teeth. All it's doing is ripping anything up out of the ground and taking it. And so all the bovids in East Africa are this kind of animal, the ones we're gonna to compare to, the, um, to our hominins. Horses, on the other hand, for those of you, if you live here, you know exactly what a horse looks like. So um, I didn't know that much about horse digestive system until I was looking at this to teach my courses. They also have a pretty massive digestive system, but it's all hindgut. It is not in the stomach, it's in the hindgut. So they actually are far more selective feeders because any toxin that comes in, which gets taken, taken a, um, care of by the, the ruminants, microorganisms, cannot be handled by a horse. That's why horses have such more sensitive diet requirements. If you look at a horse skull, it has both upper teeth and lower teeth. That allows it to pick out exactly what it wants to eat. These are primates. Those don't look really anything like either one of these. So why do we think that we can compare our primates, our <coughs> hominins, directly to browsers and grazers, either zebra or to bobbins in East Africa? If you look at all living primates, so you've got a prosimian here, you've got monkeys, you've got an ape, they are all C3. If you look at old world monkeys, whether you get a Stercopithecine, a Colobene, um, what the baboons do, what a Duke Langer does in Asia, they are all C3. Does not matter whether they have a large stomach or not. Baboons, um, in very marginal areas, I went through every study that could, was done on living primates, and what you will hear is that baboons can eat grass. Yes, they can and about five to 10% of their diet can actually be grass, and it's only done in one marginal area out of five in Africa. You also get some poop that is C4, but when you look at their hair or their teeth, they are C3. So now let's go to the fossil record. This is from Bernard Wood, and I really appreciate him allowing me to show this. What you have here are possible and archaic hominid possible hominins, you've got what would be called um, archaic hominins, and here you have the megadont, the ones that I showed you before. 
Then you get pre-modern homo and anatomically modern human. I will not be going up into this. I, I wanted to and it just wasn't, I didn't think there was gonna be enough time to do it. So let's look a little bit at the skeletons of some of these. I just picked some at random. Um, Lee, Julia Lee Thorpe in South Africa got us started doing this and has done a phenomenal job of preparing how you do enamel to do carbon isotope analysis. What I hope you see here is that all of these have flared rib cages. And Leslie Ayala once said, Lucy had no waste. If you think about it, even men have wastes. Because we have a small digestive system. When we stand up, we have a small digestive system. These others did not. But they're all hindgut fermenters because that's what all of us are and our relatives are. This is Homo ergaster, a very early Homo erectus. And what I think you'll see is that it does not look exactly like us. He probably had a waste. So what we're looking at is a different size digestive system. So. In 1999, uh, Matt Sponheimer and Julia Lee Thorpe published what I believe is probably the first paper looking at carbon isotopes in um, early hominids to figure out diet. They came up with an average of minus 8.2 per mil. At quote, this early hominid ate large quantities of carbon-13 enriched foods. And from their perspective, the thing that made them human on the human lineage is that we were eating C4 foods. All right, what they did, and I hope you can see this in this slide, is that they took that, the endpoint of C4 foods and they took the endpoint of C3 foods, and I'll remind you, this is a foregut fermenter, this is a hindgut fermenter, it is not a simple gut, either any of them. So what we have here is a zebra and we have a garanuk, but I could have picked a bunch of other ones. Well, I don't think you can compare a primate to that, but that's what they did. And then you take Homo, uh, this was Australopithecus africanus, I believe, at eight. And then they said, okay, well, it's about halfway along the line, massive quantities of C4 foods. Um, the, there is another way of doing this, and this is what I started looking at, and that is, what if you think about an offset of 10 per mil, which is what simple gutted animals have now, um, we do, roughly, or 14 per mil, what would be the difference in the diet? And what you have are the blue ones are the difference if you look at 10 per mil, and the green ones are the ones if you look at 14 per mil. And I'm not saying that either one of these is correct. It's somewhere probably in between and probably varies across these different species. What I think you'll notice is that virtually all of these have low quantities of C4 foods, if you buy my argument, or they are actually C3 feeders, just like any normal primate would be, with one exception, and that is the very robust ones in East Africa with the huge, massive uh, chewing muscles, and so. now. Uh, this cannot be cited, but Fred Grind gave me permission to point out that there is a new Paranthropus at 3.5 million, which would put it way down in here, and it is a C3 feeder. If you look at it, it's either a mix with very little C4 or it is C3. So sometime in around 1 million to 1.8 million, we ended up with a major shift that those animals became C4. It was not true before that. So I'll finish up right now with um, when we get to Homo ergaster or Homo erectus, the same exact number as you saw in the Australopithecine. But here I do not think we're looking at mostly green plants. I think here we're looking at meat, and we're pretty sure, and I think we're gonna have some speakers after me, they're gonna point out how far back this probably went. This is one of Leslie Aallo's, again, human-like body shape, probably the simple gut the way we do. I would say that probably what we're looking at when we have mixed C3 and C4 is probably a mix of hunting zebra and hunting C3 feeding browsing animals. So my conclusions, if we can consider variation in diet to appetite, which most people don't, in modern fauna, 
The diets in early hominins appear far more varied than originally appreciated. If we consider metabolic differences between animals with simple GI tracts, which most primate, all primates have, and those relying on extensive fermentation, alternative diets become distinct possibilities. Now, thank you. Oh, wait. One last one. I, I just want to say I have to thank my students, because if it weren't for my present and former students, you would not be, have heard this talk today.